And we're going to talk now with Mike Adamson from AEA. Mike is the Vice President of Member Programs and Education for AEA. And Mike, uh, this has become kind of a tradition that we sit down and yeah. chat towards the end of the show. And always happy to see you. Thanks very much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. Your format was a little different this year. Yeah. You kind of shuffled things around a little bit. Tell us about some of the changes that were at the show this year and how they've been received by the, the folks attending. Yeah, so um, the feedback we get from our attendees in the past is more, more, more. Uh, more training, uh, more time with the, with the uh, manufacturers, more time in the exhibit hall, uh, more time for networking. So, you know, it's a struggle to try and figure out how to fit all of that in. And we moved a few things around that allowed us to do two days of exhibits, a little bit longer than we normally have done, um, but two good long days of exhibits. And, uh, and then fit some more training classes in in the mornings before those exhibit hall hours. And I think we pulled it off. We've got uh, 95 hours of training throughout the week. Um, and then of course, um, a little bit more exhibit hall time, even though we went to the two days. And then, you know, like uh, every association, there's always opportunity for uh, some good networking. Mm -hmm. And um, our, our manufacturers here do a really good job of taking care of the dealers at night with some of their different functions. So um, more show more business, more convenient. Uh, and, that's, and that's how we've been looking at it. And I think that's been the case by, by the numbers we're seeing here this week. There's a really kind of a feeling of optimism, yeah. I think, on this show floor, pretty much throughout the convention hall. We've been hearing it from a lot of people. Everybody that has sat in that chair over the course of the past couple of days has said they're having a really good show. How do you, what do you, to what do you attribute that? You know, it's the, it, obviously it's products. Um, you know, the mandate's a good thing, um, and, and obviously there's a lot of focus on, on ADSB, and, uh, and we're certainly doing our part to help educate people, but you can tell the market reacts to new products, and you saw that uh, on Wednesday with the new product introductions, I think 33 total companies uh, presented, and, and that momentum, momentum carries over to the exhibit hall. Um, so they're excited to come see the products and, and come see the, the reps, and um, it certainly is attracted, you know, we're, we're also in the Dallas Metroplex, um, so it attracts the local uh, shops that, that can make it away from their, their place for a day and come see these things. So there's a lot of factors. Um, I think the economy's improved uh, as well, um, and that, that impacts us. Uh, so, it, you know, I think we, we mentioned before, it kind of feels like, you know, 05, 06 again, where mm -hmm. there's an uptick, we're on the, um, we're on the, uh, the good side of the cycle and uh, a lot of optimism looking forward in the next four or five years. And I suppose it's probably a very good thing that there is an uptick in the economy at a time when pilots and operators are being asked to shell out not a huge sum of money, but a pretty sizable chunk of change to put a new piece of equipment in their airplanes. They don't really have any choice. Right, understandably, you know, and I, and I think um, you can tell from uh, the uptick and, and the number of installed um, ADSB systems that there's still some people on the fence um, looking for prices to, to do something. Um, but, you know, they asked for, for solutions from the manufacturers and it's kind of neat to see them deliver so quickly um, with new product development and, and get it out to the marketplace. And so I think with that, you're going to have more choice, um, probably a little pressure on, on uh, the prices and whatnot. And, um, you know, hopefully you time it right so that you don't see the pressure from uh, the the demand side with uh, our shop's ability to install it. Mm -hmm. And um, that will certainly be an issue if we wait. And that's something we've got to be aware of. So we're, we're looking very closely. Right now is a good time. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're an early adopter, now's a great time. But uh, as we get closer to that, that magical date, it's going to get a little tougher. So. And yet, as with all technology, somebody might sit back and say, and you talk about the early adopters, and, and God love them for being able yeah, to do right. that. Um, but what's going to be? One of the things that, that may be causing folks to hold off a little bit is, well, well, what's going to be in the next generation? Every time you buy a computer, it's obsolete by the time it walks out the door. Right. What's going to be in the next generation of products? But people really should not be thinking along those lines they, because there is a, a hard deadline that has to be met. Right. You know, I, I think what you're going to see is um, uh, sort of a, well, we've, we actually saw that this week with some of the products that are sort of um, multi-function in that sense, mm -hmm. and um, uh, tying in, integrating with systems that are, already, that are already out there. But an early adopter gets a benefit now, and, um, and if they're otherwise spending money on that benefit, um, you know, they're missing out on that, and um, getting it for free is what I'm trying to say. And, and so I think 
you know, there's always, there's always a benefit in, in being the first with something. And the technology's been out, it's proven itself, it works. Um, it, it certainly is a safety enhancing. And, uh, and yeah, you know, you get, some, you get some weather benefit from it. So I don't know that you're going to see anything groundbreaking in the sense of, of benefit, but um, potentially it's integration with other things that we're not even, don't even know exist in mm -hmm. the marketplace. Um, I'm a tech guy myself from a consumer standpoint. And um, I'm always intrigued by version two and version three, mm -hmm. um, but I'm usually a version one buyer myself. And uh, you know, it's just fun to, to be knowledgeable about that, um, get the benefit out of it, be the first one to, uh, to get to play with the technology. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people in, the, in our industry that are that way. And uh, obviously they're helping to spread the word about the technology and hopefully changing some folks' minds. Well, and I think with, with a lot of these companies and a lot of these devices that are, being, that are being developed now, that change, that version two, might be a software upgrade as opposed to a hardware upgrade. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you've, if you've uh, invested in the hardware, uh, much like we do on the consumer side, um, I feel like you, you could probably expect that. You know, these, these systems are robust enough uh, to certainly allow for that, and I know the, our manufacturers are aware of that, and we're considering that as they develop new products and get them TSO'd and go through that process. So absolutely, I think that's uh, a, a great selling point. I was talking with your colleague Rick Perry, um, actually the day, bef uh, day before yesterday, I believe, when I first got here, and he made kind of a, an interesting point about the number of planes that are still flying around with, with 121.5 ELTs. Yeah. Um, and he said that, that a lot of those pilots might not consider upgrading b because they haven't upgraded the more modern ELT, and, and it's that kind of a mindset that is going to be, it's going to put pressure on your repair stations and your install uh, facilities as that deadline gets closer. So what can you say to the folks who are kind of waiting because they, they feel like they can just walk in and upgrade on December 31st, yeah. 2019? Well, you know, I mentioned I'm an early adopter myself. I'm, I'm not an uneducated one. Um, I do my research, and everybody does. They do it online, they talk to folks, they come to shows like this, and of course all the uh, 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 other industry trade shows that are out there, and, and you get in front of the rep, uh, manufacturer representatives and the dealers and ask the right questions, and so you're an informed consumer. And um, I think with that, you know, you, you can see the benefit, and when it, when it hits the, the sweet spot for you, um, to make that investment in your airplane, um, wherever you're at in the process, whether you're looking to upgrade your airplane or, or do something different, once those things align, um, you'll make the right choice. And, and you'll, you, know, you, you can be confident that you've got a product that's um, uh, well-built and supported by you know, proven manufacturers. And, and I trust that in, my, in the own things that I buy, but um, doing the research, uh, getting with our dealer network, um, and understanding from them. And there's a lot of questions. There's a, you know, we, the, our, our training sessions are packed because we still have questions. Mm -hmm. um, we are the experts. Um, our manufacturers in our shops certainly are. But there's a lot of, a lot of interface questions and, and how these things talk and what's right for what type of aircraft and what type of flying and all of that. So we're learning constantly. And I think if the consumer takes that approach, um, they'll end up with the right decision in the end. And Since you also are, are the person who oversees the membership, are you seeing with the burgeoning UAV market that segment of the aviation market interested in membership in the Aircraft Electronics Association? Not a groundswell, um, but we do have a couple of shops um, and, and, and actually a network of um, you know, service providers that has been established um, preparing for that. Uh, I think we're still a little bit away, um, understanding you know the NPRM came out this year. We've got to see what that really means um, for our market and how we fit in, the, um, in that scheme. Uh, but if it's flying and it has electronics, we feel like it's our space. And, uh, and so naturally our board of directors and, and uh, the staff are, are keeping up to date on everything that's going on in that space and, and making sure we're ready um, because we do see a fit. Um, and I think it's just a matter of figuring it out you know, how that evolves. Um, but. Uh, Certainly excited by those, those opportunities and, and would welcome that community uh, to our association. And yet, I can foresee a time when this convention floor has a whole bunch of $40 and $50 little quadcopters flying around, people taking pictures and such. 
you, you would think, as you said, it, it flies and there's electronics, that they would naturally gravitate towards a, right. a, a, an association like this. I, you know, what I understand in talking to some of the folks who obviously build technologies um, for these things, um, that I think you're just looking for that tipping point, really, for the first one to go and, and show up with one of those. And, and you know, um, when that happens, I, I, I agree. Um, I don't know that we'll see the whole exhibit hall flooded with those. Um, <laughs> Because you know, we'll probably <laughs> have one flying around here doing this. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and, and certainly as a as a association, um, great footage of our packed exhibit hall. You mm -hmm. know, so it'd be exciting for us too. Um, it's going to be fun to watch. It really is, and, and obviously we're going to stay tuned and and see what we can do to to provide value um, to those manufacturers, service providers, you know, everybody that's involved, the training that goes into that. Uh, so there's a lot. There's a lot to look forward to. What are you hearing from your your association members that provide electronics for for full size aircraft? Are they also excited about the prospect of having this new market of UAVs to, to go play in? Absolutely, yeah. And, um, just in conversations this week, you know, you, it's not something they're real public about. Um, but but much like I said, if it's in you know involving aircraft and electronics, that's it's their space. And I think, you know, you think of the companies that are members uh, and they're out here on the show floor, the expertise is there, the engineering is there. Um, there's some smart people. There's some smart people and, and, you know, dedicating some resources to it and getting that, uh, you know, um, uh, past the, some of those uh, corporate decision makers is, is probably what they're working on. And they're just quiet about it right now. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure um, there's some some secret engineering going on <laughs> in some of these places that, uh, you know, they're going to be ready and, and they should. Uh, it makes sense. And um, I think it's something that we all should be looking forward to. And of course, I'm sure they're also waiting to see what happens with part 107 and, and when all of that part of it goes and is finalized. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The other aspect of your job is the education piece yeah. of what goes on here. And you say you have a lot of training sessions, you work a lot with scholarships, you have a lot of those kinds of programs. Where are you as far as your, your scholarships and your training and things of that nature? Because that's always, people don't think about that side as often as they do the hardware and software side. Yeah, you know, we're really proud of our, our, uh, our program. We've got one of the largest for maintenance personnel in the industry and, and um, a number of scholarships, 23 I think we're doing this year. Um, scholarships that range from a thousand to, to uh, thirty-five thousand, depending on you know what program you want to get into, um, and it's doing well. We're, you know what we're seeing is an interest, and in, in maybe because of the new technologies we're talking about, I, I would tend to think so. We're seeing an interest again in getting into these programs, and I think the schools would would uh, second that. Um, you know, there there's uh, some connectivity um, carryover from some what you might do in the IT world that now applies in, in the cabin of an aircraft. Uh, certainly UAVs, uh, schools are focusing on that. And then of course, ADSB and, and you know, the demand for experienced technicians um, that we'll have um, is driving interest. And we're seeing that in our scholarship applications. You know, so it's a good batch this year. We haven't yet announced them. We just, uh, just completed the application process on April 1st. So we'll go back and review those and make an announcement here in, the, in a few short weeks on who those winners are. And, hopefully see those numbers increase over the next four or five years as they have this last year or two. And one of the, the ways you fund that is through, there's a silent auction here. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had a chance to go back and browse it. It's probably too late now to go back and look through the items, but I did hear there were a lot of really great things that were, um, were available for folks to make bids on, and all of those proceeds go into the, the yeah. scholarship and training program. Yeah, they do. Uh, you got another hour, okay. roughly hour and a half. Um, there's some goodies back there for sure. Uh, but you're right, those uh, go directly to the Educational Foundation and they support uh, new scholarships um, and, and existing scholarships. So the more stuff we get back there, the more, the more we can do for those students. And uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I've been a part of for 15 years. The foundation's been around for 25 and um, you know, we've done over a million dollars in awards. And uh, it's just something that, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun for me mm -hmm. uh, to go do that and, and you know, kind of encourage that next generation to, to get involved in a pretty neat industry, you know? You mentioned some of the uh, training sessions and we didn't really expand on that a great deal, but if people come to, sometimes they'll come to a convention like this for the networking and to see what's new on the, on the, on the show floor, but what kinds of, of training opportunities do you offer in the meeting rooms upstairs? Everything, I mean, we're, uh, we, 
you know, we cover it all. We're, we're connectivity, um, ADSB, of course, all the new products, um, everything. You know, we're still we're still upgrading our touchscreens. You know, we're still adding um, new software um, configurations. Uh, a lot of certification talk. Um, that's that's of great interest to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Rotocraft. Uh, you know, large cabin down to you know products for experimental. So we cover it all from a technical standpoint, and I'd say we're probably a 90-10 mix right now on technical versus business management. But you know, one of the things the association prides itself on is is being an advocate for your business and some you know small business advisory type of things. Um, certainly from a regulatory standpoint, but more and more so from just an operation standpoint. And this this year we had a few classes that are more focused on that. And it provides an option for that repair station owner manager to go sit in those, you know, um, finance and, and managerial and sales classes, mm -hmm. and then he can send his text to the to the technical uh, classes. A lot of good feedback on this on that this year, and so we'll be adding to that mix uh, in the years to come. And as we talked about, there are a lot of very smart people, but just because you're a smart software developer or engineer or technician does not necessarily mean you know how to run a business. Not, right. not to say you're not capable, yeah. but there's a there's a method to running a business that the association can help with. Absolutely, yeah. You know, a lot of experience on staff, certainly, over the years, and, and, um, and um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of um, comparisons to other small business, you know, industries, and uh, so we look at what they do and, and see what, how that can help our, our shops, and you know, it's it's interesting um, as as some of these shops start to restaff some of their folks, it frees up their time to go manage their business, and I feel like that's that's the difference this year is we've got some some shop owners who have hired sales folks to go take care of that part, keep the door open, and keeping uh, the business coming in, and they've got quality techs that are back working on that, or they're here learning something new, and that frees them up um, to go focus on their business, and it's my job to make sure I can provide tools for them to be better at what they do, and, and uh, we're working on that. Uh, With all of the focus on right now on 2020, uh -huh. and so many of the products that are here that are dealing with ADSB, getting meeting that equipage deadline, how does the association help its member companies once that deadline has come and gone, uh, so that they don't see a slump in their business, yeah. because, all right, I bought my ADSB, it's installed in the airplane, and now I'm not going to. I'm going to take a break from spending more money and and, yeah. and doing things for the airport. I think that's a valid concern. I really do. I I wonder that myself. You know, everybody looks at the next four or five years as this as this you know boom for the industry. But but what happens after that? And and um, you know I think it's it's going to be the job of these manufacturers to keep innovating. And I think as long as they do, there's things we're not even thinking about um, that will that will fit in these aircraft in four or five years and beyond. And um, I think that's been the case for the last 58 years of the association. Mm -hmm. um, you just trust that the innovators will come through with new products and services and a new way of doing things. Um, there's all kinds of, uh, we might be flying different types of aircraft, you know, um, how they're powered, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. And so that might require a new system. So there's, there's always going to be something. I do think it's a valid concern that after you're done refreshing with, with some of these products, are you ready for the next thing? But, but I trust that these manufacturers will, will, will come through with even uh, more appealing products and those early adopters will be right back <laughs> looking at, you know, what's next. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but is the association having those discussions Absolutely. internally? Absolutely, yeah. You, you know, you don't want the faucet to turn off at 2020 and then we all sit around and wonder, you know, do we not have any customers left? You know, they've all out, up, updated their air, aircraft. and mm -hmm. um, It's certainly a discussion we have, but again, we're very positive about you know, what, what we don't even know um, could be coming after that. And I think there'll, there'll probably still be some work to do after 2020, you know? Um, I don't think you just shut it down because you met the mandate. So uh, I think you have to look at that as well. Well, Mike Adamson, thank you very much for talking yeah, with us. I uh, really appreciate you taking some time to come over and, and speak with us. It, it has been a very upbeat and uh, an exciting show, yeah. a lot of great new products, and we always look forward to coming out wherever you guys are and, uh, and taking the opportunity to tell people about the new things that are out in the market. So thanks, Tom. congratulations, thanks very much. All right, thank you. Great. Appreciate it. Good to see you.
Aero News Network's coverage of the 58th Annual AEA International Convention and Trade Show, live from Dallas, Texas, is brought to you in part by the following sponsors. Now certified, Aspen Avionics Single Band ADS-B, ATX-100, and ATX-100G transceivers are the next-gen ADS-B solution that provides the features pilots need while keeping flyaway costs low. Check it out now at AspenAvionics.com. Avidine provides innovative avionics solutions for general aviation aircraft, including the IFD-540 and IFD-440 FMS GPS NAVCOMs with Geofill, hybrid touch, and full ADS-B capability. The KSN 770 is an affordable, WAS-enabled, integrated MFD with a flexible hybrid user interface from Bendix King. Get your fingers on the 770's perfect blend of touchscreen and hard buttons. Easily control your GPS navigation, NAVCOM, weather, traffic, and terrain in any condition. For more information, go to BendixKing.com. The IntelliFlight 2100 Digital Flight Control System is the perfect complement to today's integrated flight decks and is certified on the King Air and Conquest. It will now interface to a single EFIS and a mid-continent SAM 302 unit for a low-cost, complete panel upgrade. Contact us at www.genesis-aerosystems.com. An interactive links application is available in the Apple and Android app stores. This free app is a virtual simulation of the Lynx NGT9000 touchscreen cockpit display that lets pilots interact with the unit as if they had a real system in their hands. The app covers the entire Lynx family of ADS-B products, including features and options to help customers decide which Lynx model is right for their needs. Meet Sam, the new 2-inch standby attitude module from Mid-Continent Instruments and Avionics. Sam offers selectable horizontal and vertical orientation like no other, guaranteeing the perfect fit within any panel. Learn more at flysam.com. NavWorks makes ADS-B affordable. Certified or experimental, NavWorks gives you high-quality next-gen avionic solutions that dramatically increase your situational awareness. Check us out now on the web at www.navworks.com. The debate is no longer about upgrading GA aircraft with next-gen, it's about financing it. The next-gen GA fund is about doing just that. Find out more at www.nextgenfund.com. 